Hear now the word of the Lord from Matthew chapter 13, verses 51 through 58. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there. And coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. We live in an increasingly polarized world. In our country especially, there are so many things that divide and polarize us. Issues divide us. Politics divide us. Increasingly, geography divides us. There was an article this week about a rise in conservatives moving to red states and liberals moving to blue states uh, so that there isn't interaction as much as people just dividing off into different places to live. Whether that's good or bad, the point is we are increasingly polarized and divided. Really, the only thing across our country uh, that our country as a whole agrees upon is that elections, elections are important, that elections have major consequences. And buckle up, as Mike was praying about, we are coming into another presidential election. And over the course of the next year, you are going to see time and energy and untold amounts of money poured into focusing on particular key elections. But when election day finally comes, if you pick up a ballot, You're going to notice those high-ticket events, those high-ticket elections, but you're going to also see, if you look down the ballot, what are sometimes called down-ballot elections. You're going to see a lot of races that maybe you've heard nothing about, races over the governors for community colleges, over the overseers for natural resource districts. I don't even know what that does. Uh, People who are going to be involved in Metropolitan Utilities District. They bill me every month. I don't know what these people would actually do. Every year when those elections come up, I do my best to try to do some kind of research, to search, to find out who are these people? What do they do? What makes this one different from that one? And every year I come up invariably without any information. Last year, I knew someone who was running for the community college governorship. I was really excited that I had some information about that particular race. But when I come to these elections, I think to myself, well, maybe it's okay to be neutral on these matters. Maybe these are down-ballot issues, and it's okay if I'm neutral on those. I need to be wise in the way that I think, in the way that I act, in the way that I vote, but maybe those don't really matter that much. Well, it's so interesting in in Jesus' life that as much as people are attracted and interested in Jesus, there's always a desire to try to make him one of the, these down-ballot issues. I mean, there's so many things that we could focus on in our society today, so many issues, so many debates that are raging around us. Maybe it's okay, the world would say, if Jesus is something we just agree to disagree about, if he is someone that we can just be neutral about. This has been happening ever since Jesus walked the earth. People try to make him a down-ballot issue. They maybe listen to him. Maybe they're curious about him. They notice some extraordinary things about him in one way or another. But the further on that Jesus goes, and this happened not only in Jesus' day, but in every subsequent age, in every subsequent culture, the longer that people study Jesus, the longer they hear from Jesus, in spite of everything else happening, the more Jesus becomes the most polarizing issue of the day. That was true in his day. He is by far the most polarizing issue of his day, and it is still the case today. Whatever we may be struggling with, ultimately, the foundation of all of this, 
the polarizing issue of our culture and every other culture is Jesus Christ. What will you do with Jesus? As we study our passage today, the big idea is this. There is no neutrality between kingdom disciples and kingdom despisers. There's no neutral place between those two perspectives. There is no neutrality between kingdom disciples and kingdom despisers. And so our sermon outline this morning will be very simple. On the one hand, kingdom disciples, and then second of all, kingdom despisers. Kingdom disciples and kingdom despisers. Well, the first section in verses 51 and 52 deals with kingdom disciples. What is Jesus calling us to be as his disciples? Now, the passage we read this morning really abruptly drops us into a passage. If you're not familiar with where we have been or have been here or, or aren't familiar with what's going on in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus has just finished preaching and teaching different parables about the kingdom. Specifically, Jesus has been teaching seven parables about the kingdom. If you know numbers in the Bible, they sometimes have pretty significant meaning, especially when you come across seven of something. Very often that's used to communicate a a sense of completion and fullness. Uh, Early on, originally, we see that in the creation of the world. God created the world in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested from his works. That was a completion of God's good work in creation. took seven days. Well, here we have seven parables about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus has completed those. And in verse 51, we read Jesus asking, have you understood all these things? Now, the disciples say to him, yes, and obviously they don't understand everything so far, and I don't think they're claiming to understand everything. But Jesus, if you remember, has been teaching them, interpreting them the parables as they've gone along. And so as much as they need to, they understand what Jesus has been teaching about regarding the kingdom of heaven. But in verse 52, Jesus takes this a step further. That's great. You understand what I have been teaching, but more is required. And so in verse 52, he says to his disciples, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. What Jesus is getting at by this statement is that private understanding is just not enough. Jesus asks his disciples for more than just private individual understanding of what he is teaching. He wants his disciples to do something with that education. It's interesting, when Jesus talks about every scribe who has been trained, the word there translated in the English Standard Version as trained is the word that in different forms comes up through the rest of the Gospel of Matthew as the word disciple. We might translate this, therefore, as, therefore, every scribe who has been discipled for the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is telling us what he requires of kingdom disciples here in this verse. Now, when Jesus asked them originally in verse 51, have you understood all of these things? He's clearly bringing into view the intellectual nature of discipleship. That being a disciple, the most basic meaning of that word is to be a learner, to be a student, a learner. A disciple means to learn something. And Jesus wants to know if his students, his disciples, have learned from him about the kingdom of heaven. But it's very clear as Jesus has taught them about the kingdom of heaven, that even though discipleship is a necessary, or learning is a necessary part of discipleship, it is not the entirety of discipleship. It's necessary, but it is not sufficient. If you look back in verse 23 of chapter 13, Jesus talked about how discipleship, the kingdom of heaven, requires fruitfulness. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. There's that mental image. However, This indeed, this one indeed, bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, in another thirty. Discipleship requires fruitfulness. Verse 38, discipleship requires good character. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. 
A good seed is described as being sons of the kingdom. It requires some kind of good character. Verse 44, there's joy. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And we could go on and on. We are meant to understand something about the kingdom, but there are all kinds of other entailments that go with the kingdom of heaven. And in verse 52, in our passage for this morning, Jesus is telling us one of the chief entailments of what it requires, what he is requiring of his disciples in the kingdom. It requires that we become like scribes who are trained in the kingdom of heaven, so that we are like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The idea of a master of a house is it's not someone who rules over a house like a king. That's not kind of the idea here. It's the idea of a chief steward of the house. That is a steward of the house. This would be the manager of the house. The one who has responsibility for building up stores and managing provisions for the entire household. All the people who live, the, the, the family, the children, the, the other servants of the house. This is the one who makes provision, not only for today, but makes plans for the future. Setting aside what needs to be stored up so when the season comes, where those stores are necessary, they are all ready to go. That's what the master of the house is called to do. What Jesus is telling his disciples specifically, and we're going to see this through the rest of the Gospels, especially into, into the book of Acts and all the way into the New Testament letters, that what Jesus is doing is laying for them, as he's directly teaching them, a store in their minds, and he's going to continue teaching them, where he's giving them his word, the word of the kingdom, that is, they are supposed to lay up in their minds, so they are going to be ready to declare the word to others after them. Whether it's in season or out of season, at all times they are to be ready to preach the word in every circumstance. Whether it's to the upper ballot issues of the day or the down ballot issues of the day, whatever the circumstance may be, disciples are to be scribes trained to teach others with what they have learned, and particularly Jesus says these scribes are those who bring out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Jesus is talking about his relationship to the Old Testament here. Now, this isn't the first that Jesus is, the first time he's talked about his relationship to the Old Testament. If you remember in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus said, Do not think that I come to abolish the law. I've not come to abolish it, but to fulfill it that neither a jot nor a tittle will pass away until all things have been fulfilled. Well, here Jesus is saying the same thing. He's saying a disciple, a, a, a disciple of the kingdom, is like a scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven, who is able to bring out both what is new and what is old. The old is still important. Jesus wants us to be able to bring out of the stores of the Old Testament his teaching for his people. But it's not just the Old Testament. The scribes of those days could only bring out what was old. And really a, a, a darkened, incomplete understanding of what was contained in the Old. Jesus is saying not just the Old Testament, but everything in the New Testament, which primarily and fundamentally reveals Jesus, to bring out both what is old and what is new to declare to God's people. What does it mean to be a kingdom disciple? It means to be trained in the whole scriptures of the Old and New Testament to know those scriptures personally and to help others to know those scriptures. If you want to understand, if, if maybe this will help you make sense of what we do here at Harvest, essentially everything is about getting Bible into you. So that laying the word of God deeply in your soul, there are treasures for you to draw out to bring to bear on your own personal situation and to comfort and encourage those with whom you walk, uh, family members, friends, people you end up meeting. It's about getting as much of this word into you so that you are ready in season and out of season. Teachers are called to labor in preaching and teaching, of course, but disciples, all disciples are called to know this to some degree. Uh, this last... Um, uh, month when the, our denomination, the PCA, was in the General Assembly, 
um, we elected a moderator, someone who would lead the meeting. Now, there's 2,100 commissioners in that meeting. All of them have a pretty good idea of the rules. People can throw out any kind of motion, a proposal to do this or that. The one who leads the meeting better be a pretty competent person in understanding those rules, or the entire meeting is going to get railroaded and sidetracked. I've seen that happen in general assemblies in the past. But this year, the man elected was a man named Fred Greco. He's a teaching elder in Houston. And Fred Greco is a man who knows the rules cold. You could not flap him. He was unflappable. Uh, everything that people threw at him, he was able to handle. I think there was only one time that he was uh, really called on a point of order that where he was incorrect, and he handled that with good humor and with grace. But the meeting just flowed so well. You know, the, the man who wrote Robert's Rules of Order, to kind of give us the rules that, that, that help us to manage these meetings, a man named Henry Robert, he wrote another book called Parliamentary Law, and, and he wrote this, and I think this is helpful for understanding what happened at General Assembly and what Jesus is talking about here. Henry Robert wrote this, he said, no one is ever strong and forceful when he gets near the limit of his knowledge. A teacher should know far more of a subject than he ever expects to teach and a leader of a, of a meeting, a deliberative assembly, should be prepared for every emergency so that there is no danger of his being tripped up by some expert in the rules. But we saw that at a general assembly. Someone who knew more of the rules than he needed to use was prepared for every emergency that came up. And Jesus is saying the same thing of us. Would you grow in your discipleship? Much of that is about learning the Word of God better, not necessarily so that you can lead a meeting, but so that when doctrinal questions arise, when you hear some teacher spouting off something that doesn't quite sound right, do you know your Bible well enough to be able to understand, to judge that, to evaluate whether it's right or wrong? When some practical question, some opportunity arises in front of you, do you know the Word of God to guide you through those situations? Much of kingdom discipleship is an ever-growing learning and storing up of the treasures from the Word of God. That's why so much of our mission is dedicated to preaching and teaching the Word of God. Well, this is a parable. It's not one of the parables of the kingdom. Those seven parables of the kingdom said what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is a final eighth parable that is telling us what disciples of the kingdom are like. But after this, Matthew is transitioning to a brand new section where we're no longer talking about the kingdom of heaven. And Matthew is very clearly showing us that he is transitioning out of that teaching section into a new section that picks up the end of Matthew 13 and rolls all the way until we get to chapter 19. And one commentator, D.A. Carson, says that this next section is going to be characterized by a progressive polarization around the person of Jesus Christ. Like I said at the beginning of this sermon, not only in our day, even in Jesus' day, the most polarizing question in the world was what to do with Jesus. And as we continue through our study of Matthew, starting in the next verses, we are going to see that happen. That what we think of Jesus will be the most uh, polarizing question that we deal with. In 51 and 52, Jesus talked about kingdom disciples. Now we are going to see the exact contrast. It's kingdom despisers, those who despise the kingdom that Jesus has come to establish. This is in verses 53 through 58. This is the second section of the sermon text that we have this morning. In verse 53, we read, And when Jesus had finished these parables. That's what we have in the ESV. If you have another translation, there's a word in there that may be brought out in one way or another. Some translations bring it out by saying something like this, and it came to pass when Jesus finished these parables. Now that is superfluous. You don't need that to make good English sense of this verse, so sometimes it just goes without being translated. But the reason that word is there that brings out that it came to pass idea is that Matthew uses this word in five spots in the Gospel of Matthew to mark off the end of major sections of Jesus' teaching. So we saw it in Matthew 7, verse 28, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. After Jesus, after it came to pass that Jesus had finished teaching these things. Then in Matthew chapter 11, verse 1, if you remember when Jesus was teaching about the mission he was sending his disciples, 
uh, to preach the gospel of the kingdom. At the end of that, we read in Matthew 11, verse 1, and it came to pass that he finished teaching these things. Here again, verse 53, and when it came to pass that Jesus had finished these parables. It marks the end of a major section each time, and here it's the end of the teaching of the parables about the kingdom of heaven. So we're transitioning into a new section. The first thing Jesus does in this new section is that he goes to his hometown, verse 54, and coming to his hometown, his hometown is Nazareth, and in Nazareth, we read that Jesus taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? The people are astonished by Jesus. They comment, first of all, on his wisdom, his great learning and teaching. The word wisdom appears three times in the Gospel of Matthew. One commentator points out this is the third and final use of the word wisdom. They're astonished. The word wisdom is talked about rarely, but here it is to talk about Jesus. This wisdom is amazing this man has. And not only that, but his mighty works. The miracles that Jesus continued to do in healing people and driving out demons. So the wisdom he was doing, the mighty works. And then in verse 55, they're astonished because this man is a carpenter's son. That's not the kind of trade that you would go into to train to be a great rabbi. Now, the word for carpenter some commentators say this is maybe something like a general contractor kind of an idea. It means a builder of some sort. It may have involved woodwork, but there wasn't a whole lot of wood there in those days. So it also might have been stonework like masonry, although we don't know exactly. The word is tectone. Um, there's another place where this word appears. It's when Paul in 1 Corinthians 2 says that he has been appointed the chief master builder, the architectone, the chief master builder of the building of the church. That's the same word, tectone, that is used to describe Jesus here, if that gives you some idea of uh, the craft and the trade that Jesus was dedicated to. But the reason it comes up in this passage is that the people are astonished at his wisdom and his mighty works, knowing that this guy was a general contractor. Where did he get this knowledge? They can't explain it. And then they start going through his family. Isn't his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all of these things? Now, notably, when we talk about the list of Jesus' brothers, James and then later Judas, we're talking about the James and the Jude who wrote those letters of the New Testament. And that's probably why their names are included here among the other brothers. They are famous in the early church when Matthew is putting a pen to paper to write this letter. But in those days, these were just common people. James, Judas, Joseph, Simon. Aren't his brothers here? Aren't his sisters here? Now, it's interesting. If you have a family member who is someone famous, or if you have a family member who knows someone famous, that's usually something that we brag about. I often brag that my aunt was the first employee of Cabela's, uh, that great uh, sporting outfitter store. She used to uh, fill the, some of the original mail order things. My aunt was the first employee there. Um, you, you might know other people that you are related to in some kind of a sense. That's something we usually brag about. But it's quite a turn in verse 57 when they take this as a reason to be offended. And they took offense at him. They know this great man who can do all of these things. They know his family members. They don't pull out the picture. Do you remember when Jesus was a little boy? Now he's this great teacher, and we knew him when. They don't take that tack. They are offended by him. And Jesus goes on to explain a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. Jesus' kingdom is despised by these people because he grew up in their midst. And so we read in verse 58, and he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now, the fact that he did not do many mighty works there doesn't mean that he didn't do any mighty works there. One commentator really points out he did do some. It's not that Jesus' power was dependent on the faith of the people as though he really needed them to believe in order to pull his 
the, 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 the tricks that he was going to trick them. No, these were real miracles, and Jesus did perform some mighty works there, just not many. Why? Well, because to perform many mighty works in a place where people did not believe him would be what Jesus warned against earlier when he talked about, do not cast your pearl before swines. Or in Matthew chapter 13, verse 12, where he said, for to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. What we saw about the kingdom disciples is that they are to be people who are constantly growing. They have something. They have particularly a stewardship appointed over the household of faith. And they are constantly growing, constantly amassing treasures new and old so that at the right time they can bring out these treasures when the need arises. Those who have, more will be given and they will have an abundance. But for the kingdom despisers, even what they have, namely access to Jesus in this moment, will be taken away. They are not provided many miracles. They lose the access that they have. What we are seeing of Jesus in these two different perspectives, the kingdom discipleship perspective and the kingdom despising perspective, is that there's no middle ground. There's no neutrality. It's like trying to idle your car on a hill. Um, if you've ever come up from Saddle Creek, come up California, and there's a, a red light on 40th, if you're kind of coming to turn to the neighborhood to get to harvest, and you ever get stopped at that red light, I pray that I don't get stopped at that red light because that is such a steep hill. Uh, woe to those who are stopped at that red light in the winter when it's icy because you sit there and it's such a steep hill that you have to, you know, do the, you're not supposed to do this generally, but the two foot pedal thing where you're slowly letting off the, the brake as you are pushing down on the accelerator because if you don't, you're going to slide backwards. There is no idling at the top of that hill. Either you will be going forward because you're using the gas to move forward, or you are going to fall backwards into whoever might be on their brakes behind you. That's what life in the kingdom is like. Either you are moving forward with Jesus or you are sliding backwards. There is no neutrality. The application then is that we are to be people who pursue growth, to pursue progress, pursue a discipleship of kingdom growth. Again, our big idea is that there is no neutrality between kingdom disciples and kingdom despisers. If you ever read the Puritans, they were so aware of this. They were constantly looking and watching for threats that might lead them, even if they are not wanting to, to slide backwards. John Bunyan in Pilgrim's Progress talked about how when Christian puts on all the armor from Ephesians 6, but there's no armor for the back. You ever notice that in Ephesians 6? All the armor is front-facing. Either you are charging in the battle against Apollyon, the destroyer, armed with the sword of the spirit and the shield and all the other armor, or you are turning tail with an unshielded backside. There's no armor for the back. You're moving forward or you're dying. There's no other option. Or John Owen famously wrote, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Again, there's no neutrality in this life. There's no treading water in Christian discipleship. Either you are swimming or you are sinking. Those are the two options. Why is this? Why is there no neutrality? It's because what the entire scriptures teach us is that Christianity is a cosmic war. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual powers and principalities in the heavenly places. And against those enemies whom we cannot see, either we are growing, following Jesus, empowered by his spirit, wielding well the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, or we're being eaten alive. You see, we are born actually not just in a neutral place where we can either go toward the good or toward the bad. The problem is that we are born sinners that we were conceived in iniquity and born in sin. We were guilty, condemned from the womb. 
We were born with a corruption of our nature where we didn't naturally look to God in the way that Adam did when he was initially created before the original sin. But after he sinned, all of us have been born where uh, by nature we are turned away from the Lord, turned to find solutions to our problem in this created world rather to the creator than to the creator of all things. And because we are guilty from the womb, because we are corrupt in our nature, because out of that corruption flows a thousand acts of sin in our lives, because of this, we are without hope, save for God's sovereign mercy. That's one of the first questions that every member of this church has to act. Do you acknowledge that you are a sinner in the sight of God, justly deserving his wrath and and displeasure, and without hope, save for his sovereign mercy? Every member in a PCA church has to affirm that because it's true. Then the second question, if you remember it, is about the gospel. The gospel that the Father sent his only Son into this world to live a a perfect life with perfect righteousness, not just as God, but as the God who took upon himself a human nature. The Son of God, the second person of the triune God, came into this world, took upon himself a human nature, lived a perfect life in our place, but also he died in our place, a cursed, shameful, wrathful death, a death that he died not because of him, not because of his sin, for he had none, but because of us and because of our sin. But on the third day, Jesus Christ rose from the dead victorious over sin, death, and the devil. Death could not hold him because it had no lasting claim on him. Jesus rose victorious. And in this war, either you are fighting with a losing hand, you are fighting a losing battle because you do not have the strength or the equipment to win it, or you are looking to Jesus Christ in faith and growing in faith in him Because he is the one who has won the victory. Our situation is like Peter. Do you remember Peter when he saw Jesus walking on the water? And he says, Jesus, if you call, I will come. And Jesus called him, and Peter began walking on the water. And so long as Jesus' eyes were fixed on Jesus, he was able to make progress to Jesus until he noticed the waves. And once his eyes were taken off Jesus, he began to sink. Either you are walking on water with eyes fixed on Jesus through faith, where you're sinking, you're drowning. There is no middle ground. If you don't know Jesus this morning, if he is not the Savior whom you were looking to for your hope and your faith and your salvation to rescue from sin, the first step, what you must do this morning, and don't delay, you have no guarantee about how long you may be given left in this life before you die or before the Lord Jesus returns. Your first step is to repent from your sins and to believe in Jesus for your salvation. Turn to him and be saved. But if you do know Jesus, what this passage is teaching us is that it is essential to continue to pursue discipleship growth. Well, how do you pursue discipleship growth? Well, I, I think it's helpful to think about four C's, growing in content, first of all. What's your plan for studying the whole counsel of God? What's your plan for getting more Bible into you? Not only content, but character. It's not just about knowing, but how are you growing in your prayer life? How are you growing in repenting from and confessing your sins? How are you growing in obedience to what Jesus has called you to do in this life, in the stewardship of what he has entrusted to you? Content, character, contribution. How are you as you worship How are you serving other people? Again, the point is not to earn something from God. The point is, as you follow Jesus in obedience, how is that reflected in your life? And then finally, coaching. That's not a great word for it, but we have to get that fourth C in there somewhere. Who is encouraging you? Who is discipling you? Who is shepherding you? Who is correcting you, exhorting you, training you where you are right now? Jesus calls kingdom disciples to pursue a particular goal, to pursue a kind of training that equips them to train others. This is our mission as a church, to be disciples who worship and serve. All of us are called into this work. 
although it looks different for different people in different roles. It's particularly true for officers in the church, especially for those who labor in preaching and teaching. However, again, this is something that all of us are called to do. Husbands, you are called to lead your wives spiritually. Fathers and mothers, you are called to lead your children spiritually. All of us, wherever we are, we are all called to lead our family and our friends spiritually, whenever the Lord opens up conversations to share the gospel with them, especially with those who do not yet know the Lord Jesus. Are you prepared, if it comes up, intellectually and spiritually, to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with gentleness and respect? I want to give you a particular application. If if you want to grow, especially if you're in a place where you feel stuck in your discipleship, here's a clear application. I've printed a number of uh, copies of a booklet uh, called Fruitfulness and Faithfulness. These are totally free, um, but they're uh, out there or out there. If we run out of them or if you would prefer a digital copy, let me know and I can get you one. But it talks about the fruitfulness that we are called to in the Christian life and the faithfulness that Jesus requires of us to follow him. Fruitfulness and faithfulness, the mission and mandate of every Christian. I'd encourage you to take time, maybe even this Lord's Day, to read this. But especially at the end, there's there's an assessment, a discipleship assessment test at the end. There's about 30 questions to think through your life. These aren't points that you need to add up, and we're trying to figure out whether you score high enough to get into heaven. That's not the point of this. The point of this assessment tool is to try to identify areas for your growth, And so I'd ask you to take this and then consider scheduling an appointment with Andrew or with me to talk to these results. We would love to shepherd you by helping you to personalize the plan that you have to grow. Not that we can help you to grow. God alone gives the growth, but to think about how to grow and the content of the Bible that you're studying, the the character, what do you need to do as a person, the, the way you serve and your contribution, and to give you personal coaching in this. Because what we are all called to do as kingdom disciples is to be the people embodying what happens in 52. To become like a scribe who has been discipled for the kingdom of heaven, being like a master of a house who has all of these riches, all of these treasures, new and old, for your life and the lives of those whom God has providentially put around you. I pray that this morning, wherever Jesus is personally calling you to take that next step of faith, and obedience, that you would follow him where he leads you as a kingdom disciple that he describes here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would give us Jesus. We pray that he would be the sole sufficiency of our lives. And we pray that he would be our pursuit, that we would seek to grow, not seek to idle at the top of a hill where we will inevitably backslide. But that you, by the grace of your Holy Spirit, would give us faith to follow Jesus in obedience, to go after him wherever he would lead us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.